So we're very happy tonight to have an event honoring the Bahula on his uh, 200th birth anniversary, uh, the religion of unity and unity of religion, remembering the Baha'i faith at this 200th anniversary. And it was really an opportunity that became obvious once we heard about it. We're all very occupied at the moment with the 200th anniversary of Harvard Divinity School. <laughs> and we have celebrations Thursday, Friday, Saturday this week about that. But then when Professor Degani appeared on the scene a few months ago, uh, he informed me that this was also a very significant anniversary year in the Baha'i faith. And it seemed obvious, particularly at the Center for the Study of World Religions, to have an event honoring this occasion. In fact, a few weeks ago, we had a lunchtime discussion. Professor Degani talked about, is the Baha'i faith a world religion? And what counts as a world religion? What kind of universality do you need to have? And we had a wonderful discussion, and we said, well, then we should do this tonight as well. We didn't know about the rain, but thank you all for coming out in the rain. So I think our speaker is known to many of you, but let me just introduce him. So Sasha Degani received his MA in Islamic Studies, Political Science, and Protestant Theology, Religious Studies in Friedrich Schiller University in Ena in uh, Germany. And he also had a fellowship, an exchange fellowship at the Center for Arabic and Middle Eastern Studies at the Univers American University in Beirut. He completed his PhD studies in the Arabic Department of the Free University of Berlin with his research conducted as part of a fellowship project, Figurations of the Martyr in European and Middle Eastern Literature. He has been a research scholar at the Center for Literary and Cultural Research in Berlin. He has taught courses on Shiite Islam, Islamic intellectual history, and the Baha'i faith at the Free University, and also at uh, Christian Albrecht's University in Kiel, where he has been a visiting professor. Currently, he works at the research department of the Baha'i World Center in Haifa. His interests include the Baha'i faith and its historical angles and current contemporary life, uh, but also more generally figures, texts, and concepts fundamental, of fundamental significance to the history of the monotheistic traditions. His research this semester at the center here has focused on the classification of the Baha'i faith as a world religion, comparing the classification in the German academy with the way that world religion is thought about in the English-speaking environment. He has published widely uh, on martyrdom, on messianism, and co-edited uh, just two years ago a volume, Martyrdom in the Modern Middle East. So we'll hear him speak tonight on the religion of unity and the unity of religion, and we welcome Sasha Degani. Thank you so much uh, for this very kind um, introduction, uh, by Professor Clooney. Um, it is indeed a privilege and a pleasure to be here today and to speak about the um, bicentenary of uh, Baha'u'llah. And I'm happy that the weather outside did not stop you mm -hmm. from, from coming uh, today. Um, uh, it's also a strange coincidence, as Professor Clooney pointed out, that the bicentenary of the birthday of Baha'u'llah overlaps with the bicentenary of the Harvard Divinity School, and I might be pretty lucky that I arrived right in this year, and it attracts <laughs> much more attention to my work than it might have been done in any other year. Um, um, although I'm, I might not fully agree with Professor Clooney's intro when he introduced me to the Harvard uh, the, um, Divinity faculty about a few months ago, suggesting that because of this overlap, Baha'u'llah might have graduated from the Harvard <laughs> Divinity School, which is kind of an interesting thought, but I don't think that that was actually the case. Um, so for my presentation today, um, Professor Clooney pointed out that I had a presentation about one month ago, and that presentation before, um, in, a, in a way, of course, I'm not going to repeat because some of the friends who were there, it's not fair to them to go into the same topic. <coughs> it was about the classification of the Baha'i faith in the German academy 100 years starting with the beginning of the early 20th century and Arminius Wambere and Ignaz Goldsier coming to nowadays in Germany comparing that with the Islamic world and how the Islamic world sees the Baha'i faith and classifies it. So that will not be repeated today, but instead what I'm going today and present um, to you today is about the life of Baha'u'llah, 
his writings, The Principle of Unity, and also trying, because to some extent I think this might be more interesting to the audience today, um, how the principle of unity and development of the Baha'i faith expressed itself in the American Baha'i community. So I have something prepared for you on the life and writings of Baha'u'llah um, covering the principle of unity and at the last part I will try to show something related to the historical developments of the American Baha'i community. So we will start um, in America. The first public mention of the Baha'i faith in the United States was at the World's Parliament of Religions in 1893. The 1893 World's Parliament of Religions held on the shore of Lake Michigan in Chicago was the largest and most spectacular event among many other congresses in the world's Colombian exposition. Today, it is recognized as the birth of formal interreligious dialogue worldwide and a captivating young Hindu by the name Svavi Vivekananda fascinated the audience of maybe some few, several thousand, four or five thousand people present speaking about the concept of unity of uh, religions. It was on the, uh, September 23rd in 1893, a little over um, a year after Baha'u'llah's ascension, that in a paper written by Henry Jessup, a Presbyterian and founder of the American University of Beirut, a place which I studied about 15 years ago in Beirut, that the founder actually, during this conference of the World pa um, Parliament, referred to a, a publication of E.G. Brown, the famous Orientalist from Cambridge University, who had just met briefly before 1893 and before the passing of Baha'u'llah in 1892, directly Baha'u'llah and had an encounter with Baha'u'llah. And Jessup thought that the words conveyed by Brown uh, to posterity, that is the words that Baha'u'llah addressed to him, were sentiments so Christ-like that he wanted and he thought it would deserve to be quoted and cited in that conference. So I will now go into the encounter of Brown with Baha'u'llah in this uh, city of Akka in North Palestine in the late 19th century to show to you how actually a non-Baha'i, a member of, uh, of the academic Oriental Studies community saw um, Baha'u'llah. And it gives us some impression also, I think, about the char charisma that Baha'u'llah as a founding figure and prophetic figure of the Baha'i faith had. So we can read, um, this is what uh, Brown writes. Um, he says, um, in the corner, where the divan met, he's now in, in the house, he's in a sp specific room, and he's meeting Baha'u'llah. In the corner where the divan met the wall, sat the wondrous and venerable figure crowned with the felt headdress <coughs> of the kind called Taj by dervishes, but of unusual height and make, round the base of which was uh, wound a small white turban. The face of him on whom <coughs> I gazed I can never forget, though I cannot describe it. Those piercing eyes seem to read one's very soul, power and authority set on that ample brow, while the deep lines on the forehead and face implied an age which the jet black hair and beard flowing down in indistinguishable luxuriance almost to the waist seemed to belie. No need to ask in whose presence I stood, I bowed myself before one who is the object of a devotion and love which kings might envy and emperors sigh for in vain. A mild, dignified voice bade me to be seated and then continued. So these are now the words that Baha'u'llah addresses to Brown and Jessup quotes these verse, uh, words later on in the World Parliament. Praise be to God that thou hast attained. Thou hast come to see a prisoner and an exile. We desire but the good of the world and happiness of the nations Yet they deem us a stir up of strife and sedition, worthy of bondage and banishment. That all nations should become one in faith, and all men as brothers, that the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of men should be strengthened. What harm is there in this? Yet so it shall be these fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars shall pass away, and the most great peace shall come. Do not you in Europe need this also? Is not this that which Christ foretold? 
Yet do we see your kings and rulers lavishing their treasures more freely on means for the destruction of human race than on that which would conduce to the happiness of mankind. These strifes and this bloodshed and discord must cease and all men be as one kindred and one family. Let not a man glory in this that he loves his country. Let him rather glory in this that he loves his kind. Such, so far as I can recall them, were the words which besides many others I heard from Baha. Let those who read them consider well with themselves whether such doctrines merit death and bonds and whether the world is more likely gain or lose by their diffusion. Brown was obviously more than impressed by the charismatic figure of Baha'u'llah. There can be no doubt about that. Um, but it should be mentioned briefly um, that although he did not think that Baha'u'llah deserved banishment, later on in his writings, and because of time I can't go too deep into it, he actually had his doubts if the global vision and consciousness of the Baha'i faith could do service in light of the political advancement of Iran. So in a way, he was kind of um, intrigued if that would be possible to have a global vision, but also foster a revolutionary spirit in Iran, a spirit in Iran which he thought might be very necessary for the advancement you know, of the constitutional revolution, for example. So I would see Brown as a very interesting character who gives to posterity an, an, an idea who Baha'u'llah was and his charismatic spirit and the message of peace and unity. And at the same time, you know, maybe uh, favoring other movements at that time in Iran who, from his perspective, were more political and also in a way maybe more willing to have an oppositional spirit to the government, which was not directly what Baha'u'llah had written and was then later on translated um, into the action of the Baha'i community. So the question that arises, why is the Edward, um, Edward Brown, the famous Cambridge Orientalist, seeing Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'is in Akka, in, in 19th century, late 19th century north um, of Palestine. Um, here we see a map which shows the banishment of Baha'u'llah. Uh, Baha'u'llah was born in the year 1817 by the name Mirza Hussein Ali as the son of a Persian minister in Persia. Due to his belief in Sayyid Ali Muhammad, also known by the title of the Bab, um, who claimed you know, to be the messianic fulfillment of Shia Islam and an inaugurator of a new dispensation. And due to his assistance to the Babi movement, Baha'u'llah was imprisoned in Tehran in the year of 1852 and put into a prison of uh, Siah Chal. After the year 1852, um, the exile and banishment of Baha'u'llah starts and from country to country, first by the Qajar king Nasr al-Din Shah and later by the Ottoman kings, he is banished to Baghdad where he lives 10 years. After Baghdad, he's continued in, in banishment to the Ottoman land in Constantinople and Adrianople for five additional years. And eventually he is exiled as a prisoner to Akka in the northern part of uh, Palestine where the prisoners um, in the Ottoman, pe Ottoman period when they wanted to get rid of criminals and stir of sedition, they would send them to the north of Haifa in hope that the, the further Baha'u'llah is away from his home country, the, m the more actually it, it would lead to a halt of the movement and its growth. Um, in the year 1868, when Baha'u'llah arrived in Haifa, this is again one of the coincidences in his history, as we have Harvard Divinity School and the Bicentennial of Baha'u'llah, we have the German Templars from South Germany, Baden-Württemberg, Protestants, who in the same year, in the same summer of 1868, moved to Haifa. And you can see here the German colony on this side. And then if you look across the bay, you will see here that part would be Akka. So here we can see the German colony at the Templar Street, nowadays the Ben Gurion Street, which would lead to the Mount Carmel, where, where at the moment the Baha'i holy places are. The German Templars arrive in 1868 and settle in, in Haifa, Palestine. And there's an encounter and meetings also between Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha with the leaders of the German Templars. Um, I just chose this because it shows pretty well how Haifa looked like in the late 19th century and gives us an impression 
the Templars moved to Haifa because they thought the time of the return of Jesus Christ is imminent. So they, they w went because of um, eschatological expectations um, to this place. Um, here we have uh, two pictures of the citadel where Baha'u'llah was imprisoned in Akka. In the year 1868, when he arrives in Akka, he's imprisoned two years in, in this prison. And on the right side, you see the prison cell, which later on was renovated. And this is now a pilgrimage uh, site for the Baha'is in Akka. So we go back to the map, which shows the banishment of Baha'u'llah. And from here on, I just thought I'd move a bit out from an encounter with Baha'u'llah and the, his last part, the last part of his life. And I show you some of the texts from Baha'u'llah who focuses on the principle of unity, which is at the core of the presentation today. Um, Baha'u'llah's literary activity, from the perspective of the Baha'is, we see it as sacred texts or inspired divine words. Baha'u'llah's activity actually starts really in the Baghdad period. We have a few works that he wrote in, in the Tehran period, but the most important works that we have from him start in the Baghdad period and continue till his death in, in 1892. And I have chosen for you just a few extracts from the Baha'i writings focusing on the principle of unity. When we go on the internet web page, like the Baha'i reference library, and I did that just a few days ago, and you type in unity or oneness or love, we will see that about 700 entries exist just in the Baha'i reference library related to the topic of unity and oneness. And the topic of love, at least 500 entries I was able to find. So that brings about more than 1,000 passages in the translated writings of Baha'u'llah on the topic of unity and love. But since I don't want you to suffer too much today, of course, I'm not <laughs> going to read to you more than 1,000 extracts. I have really just chosen a few extracts which hopefully give us an idea how the principle of unity is understood from the writings of Baha'u'llah. So here in the early Baghdad period, there's a work by Baha'u'llah called The Hidden Words, al kalimat Makdune, where he says, O children of men, know ye not why we created you all from the same dust, that no one should exalt himself over the other. Ponder at all times in your hearts how you were created. Since we have created you all from one same substance, it is incumbent on you to be even as one soul. So very, very clearly in this early work from Baha'u'llah, we have the idea of the oneness of humanity, regardless of race, regardless if someone is rich or poor, regardless of gender, um, and many other things. If we continue in the writings of Baha'u'llah in that time period, we see that in the Book of Certitude, which is written about 1862, one year before Baha'u'llah is banished from Baghdad to the Ottoman period, we get an idea of what Baha'u'llah understands of, on the unity or oneness of God. He writes, to every discernment, discerning and illumined heart, it is evident that God, the unknowable essence, the divine being, is immensely exalted beyond every human attribute, such as corporeal existence, ascent and descent, egress or regress. Far be it from his glory that human tongue should adequately recount his praise, or that human heart comprehend his fathomless mystery. He is and has ever been veiled in the ancient eternity of his essence and will remain in his reality everlasting hidden from the sight of man. So the essence of God is beyond comprehension. It is beyond understanding. And there is no direct connection from the understanding of men to the essence of God. This is, the, this is why the Baha'i faith could be indeed called as the fourth monotheistic religion, because it shows how deeply actually the source of creation is one, but how also exalted this divine source is from the Baha'i perspective. But So how then do we know about God if his essence is beyond understanding. And in the same work Baha'u'llah writes about the unity of the prophets, the source of infinite grace, that is God, has caused those luminous gems of holiness to appear out of the realm of the Serb spirit. In the noble form of the human temple and be made manifest unto all men, that they may impart unto the world the mysteries of the unchangeable being and tell of the subtleties of his imperishable essence. These sanctified mirrors that is, the manifestations of God in Baha'i terminology or the prophets and the messengers, like Jesus, uh, Buddha, 
Muhammad Moses or from the understanding of Baha'is for nowadays Baha'u'llah, these sanctified mirrors are one and all the exponents on earth of him who is the central orb of the universe, its essence and ultimate purpose. From him proceed their knowledge and power. From him is derived their sovereignty. The beauty of the countenance is but a reflection of his image, and the revelation is a sign of his deathless glory. So here we saw just three quotes from the hidden words about the oneness of mankind, then in the kitab iran about the transcendent essence of God, and how the names and attributes of God manifest themselves in creation and specifically in, in the chosen uh, divine mirrors, which we call me messengers or manifestations of God. Um, to try to sum up this principle of unity, and that is familiar to um, the Baha'i friends in, th in the room today, we call it the ringstone symbol. We see here three different worlds, three different levels, and they're all united to one force that comes bottom down or the other way around. In the Baha'i terminology, the upper world is the world of God called Al-Haq in Arabic. The, mi the middle world is the world of the divine Logos, the divine will, or the divine intellect, maybe more as a philosophical term. And eventually, we come to the world of creation, Al-Khalq. There's a verse in the Quran which says, Lahul Amr wal Khal, and to him belongs the world of Amr, and Khan. So there's a third world, if we read that verse uh, with attention in the Quran. Um, these three worlds, however, are united by a kind of a Holy Spirit, or the divine intellect, emanating from God into humanity through the intermediary of the divine manifestations. On the left and the right side, you see two stars in the form of a human body, two heikals, as we call it in Arabic. This is uh, a symbol for the Bab and Baha'u'llah as a twin manifestation, the twin founders of the Baha'i faith. Um, if there's more time, maybe in the question and answer session, I can speak a bit more about the Bab, but I don't think that I can do it right now. Um, just to mention, for those of you who know Arabic, the symbol um, is written in two letters, the letter B and the letter Ha which of course is, is a symbol for the greatest name according to the Baha'is of God, Baha, which is translated into English as glory, or in the Hebrew it would be the, the kabod. Um, so the letter B and the letter Ha also have very deep mystical meaning in all the monotheistic traditions, but again because of time and because I, I promised to Professor Clooney to keep the presentation simple, I will not go too deep into it, but I'm happy to discuss later on the, the mystical um, idea behind the letters of uh, Ba and Ha in the Persian and Arabic language. So Baha'u'llah then says, coming back to the principle of unity of religion, there can be no doubt whatever that the peoples of the world of whatever race or religion derive their inspiration from one heavenly source and are the subject of one God. The difference between the ordinance under which they abide should be attributed to the varying requirements and exigencies of the age in which they were revealed. So, in other words, when Baha'is say or speak about the unity of religion, Baha'is believe that the teachings of the divine me messenger fall into two different parts. One part is the eternal part, is the core, and it deals with the idea of spirituality, with morality, with ethical values, and it is not changed. So Baha'is do not believe that Baha'u'llah has brought everything that he has written in, in the sacred texts of the Baha'i faith is new. Indeed, it is a ratification of what existed in the past. We have it in the Quran, we have it in, in, in the teachings of Buddha, we have it in, in the New Testament, and we have it in, in the teachings of Moses, something like the Mosaic Decalogue that all of us are familiar with, thou shalt honor thy parents, you know, to believe in God, thou shalt not steal. So there is kind of an ethical monotheism that is the core and does not change from Baha'i perspective. At the same time, the Baha'is believe there's a second part of religious teachings, and this is more addressing the social needs of humanity. And these social needs, they need to change, and this could be related to the question of divorce or marriage or inheritance, but from Baha'i perspective, this is not the essential part of religion. It's a changing part, and that part is in progress. It has to change because the needs of humanity change 
after some time, so it should be adjusted. But that also means that, pro that re revelation or religion becomes relative to some extent. And we can see it beautifully in this quote by Mshore Effendi from 1947, addressed to the United Nations Committee in Palestine. The fundamental principle enunciated by Baha'u'llah, the follower to the follower of his faith um, firmly believe, is that religious truth is not absolute but relative, that divine revelation is a continuous and progressive process, that all great religions of the world are divine in origin, that their basic principles are in complete harmony, that their aims and purposes are one and the same, that their teachings are but facets of one truth, that their functions are complementary, that they differ only in the non-essential aspects of their doctrines and the missions represent successive stages in the spiritual evolution of human society. So that's just to give you some idea how the Baha'is understand the principle of unity and the unity of religion. Um, after 10 years that Baha'u'llah was banished in Baghdad, shortly before he was further on continued his, his banishment continued to the Ottoman land, to Constantinople and Adrianople. In the year 1863, um, Baha'u'llah gathered his family and some of his closest friends exactly in these days of April. We call it the days of the uh, Garden of Rezvan. And in the 1863, in the Garden of Rezvan, Baha'u'llah proclaimed <coughs> some very, very important principles that is important to understand in light of the mission of Baha'u'llah. One of the teachings that Baha'u'llah here said is that when the Bab came to Iran, the Bab saw his mission as something that would be necessary to prepare humanity for the advent of someone who would come after him. Very similar to the relationship of John the Baptist and Jesus, the, the Bab actually, which means the gate, the translation of the Bab is the gate, saw himself as the gate to something more important that would come after him. So Baha'u'llah, after 10 years of uh, banishment in Baghdad, um, claims to be the promised one of which the Bab has, has been speaking in Iran, which in itself implies that he's the promised one of the past uh, religions. In addition to that, Baha'u'llah, at least from my personal understanding, and also to be clear, everything I present today is my personal understanding. No one in the Baha'i community is obliged to see that as authority or to follow it, and everyone is more than free to come to his own conclusions. Um, from my personal study, there are two additional messages that Baha'u'llah gives in the Garden of Rezwan, which I see as very important for the understanding of the principle of unity. The, the next principle that he announces is that the names and attributes of God, and specifically the, his name Ar-Rahman, uh, the merciful, um, has merged all humanity into the ocean of purity. So the concept of something, someone else, something else being impure from Baha'u'llah is not timely anymore. The next principle that he announces, which I think goes very practically with it, and is a necessary step, is that Baha'u'llah says that the principle of the sword, the idea of militant jihad or holy war, has to be abolished. And these principles he announces in 1863 with a number of additional works which he writes about, the poetical and mystical works, the, the, the holy mariner in which he, from the understanding of the Baha'is of that time, actually predicts his further sorrows in the future. And the holy mariner as such is pretty interesting as a symbol because it's the uh, gubernatio dei for those who are deeper in, in, in philosophy and, and uh, theology. But we will continue, and we will see that Baha'u'llah, actually, what he says um, about abolishing the sword and the idea of impurity, he repeats that in other tablets later on in the Ottoman period. And this is a passage from his writings where he says, the unbelievers and the faithless have set their minds on four things. Now, to be clear, when he speaks about unbelievers and faithless, he actually does not mean the atheists or agnostics, not in this context. He actually speaks about those who are religious, who abuse religion to achieve something that creates disunity. And then he's, he, he lists what they are saying. Their minds are on the things, first, the shedding of blood. Second, the burning of books. Third, the shunning of the followers of other religions. Fourth, the extermination of other communities and groups. Now, however, to the strengthening grace and potency of the word of God, these barriers have been demolished. 
So you see, to create unity among humanity from the Baha'i perspective, it is not only sufficient to speak the f and about the fact that we are one. One has clearly to analyze what are the obstacles, and these obstacles have to be clearly removed after being addressed. And I thought it is a quite interesting approach from Baha'u'llah to just list these obstacles. The positive way to put that would be, as Baha'u'llah says, O oh people, consort with the followers of all religions in the spirit of friendliness and fellowship. And below you see an Ayatollah from Iran, Masumi um, Tehrani, who about two years ago took exactly this quote from Baha'u'llah as a Shia scholar in Iran and made a calligraphy out of that and mm -hmm. send it to the Baha'is in Haifa out of respect to the idea of a tolerance of religions. Quite an outstanding a symbolic act of tolerance which is, uh, creates hope among, uh, you know, related to the relationship of Shia scholars and the Baha'i faith. Um, in the Ottoman period, then Baha'u'llah moves on and speaks about the principle of unity also in very practical matters. He addresses several rulers of that time. He addresses the ecclesiastic and world religious leaders. And out of the several rulers, again, because of time, I have only chosen an extract, which a passage from a um, letter which is addressed to Queen Elizabeth in England. He says, we have been informed that thou hast forbidden the trading of slaves both men and women. God has truly destined a reward for thee because of this. We have also heard that thou hast entrusted the reins of counsel into the hands of the representatives of the people. Thou indeed hast done well, for thereby the foundations of the edifice of thine affairs will be strengthened, and the hearts of all that are beneath thy shadow, whether high or low, will be tranquilized. O ye the elected representatives of the people in every land, Take ye counsel together, and let, let your concern be only for that which profiteth mankind and better the condition thereof. So clearly, Baha'u'llah praises Elizabeth for forbidding slavery and the problem of racism, which is also, in the same time, 1863, an important topic in the United States, um, as we know. In addition, he praises her for accepting a parliamentary monarchy. Why? Because with the addition of the parliament, the principle of consultation between human beings can be implemented and can be translated into reality. And of course, to achieve unity, um, it is necessary to have a space where all human beings, regardless of their uh, diverse backgrounds, you know, are able to freely express what they think. That same quote continues, regard the world as the human body which too, though at its creation whole and perfect, has been afflicted through various causes with grave disorders and maladies. Not for one day did it gain ease, nay, its sickness waxed more severe as it fell under the treatment of ignorant physicians who gave full rein to their personal desires and have erred grievously. We behold it in these days at the mercy of the rulers so drunk with pride that they cannot discern clearly their own best advantage, let alone the advantage of the rest of the world, that which the Lord has ordained as the sovereign remedy and mightiest instrument of the healing of all the world is the union of all its peoples in one universal cause or one common faith. So again, Baha'u'llah established this idea of unity of religion and the oneness of religion. But f for the presentation today, what is more important than that is that he speaks about the human body. And he, he asks the people to, to reflect about how the human body functions. Why, again, my personal understanding is that the human body is a very perfect example of unity and diversity. The human body has different organs, and all of these different organs have their own functioning. But they need to cooperate, and they need to come together. And so he compares humanity to the human body. In other words, if we have a problem, in one part of our body, our right hand, or our left foot, we do not hopefully and directly, you know, cut it and amputate it and throw it away. Because unity is at the core of humanity, but a unity that accepts diversity. Other quotes in the Baha'i writings would speak about the beauty of a garden. Because the garden, in a way, has a structure which is in order, something gives order to it, and at the same time, the garden, garden has diversity. It has different shapes, 
It has different colors. And indeed, the Baha'i varieties explicitly state that it is necessary to have these different forms. Um, and this difference and the diversity in the unity creates beauty. And so it might not be by chance that Baha'u'llah indeed loved gardens. And many of the significant messages of Baha'u'llah as the garden of Najibiyeh in Baghdad was announced in the garden. Here we have the, the shrine of Baha'u'llah in Akka. Uh, when he passes away, you see the different forms and the colors and how it gives beauty. And also to mention briefly, even in the time period when Baha'u'llah was in Tehran, he brought a number of leading Babis to the hamlet of Badash, which was clearly three different gardens for those of you who are familiar with the Babi history. And he assisted uh, a female disciple of the Bab, Tahir al-Ghurratul Ain, in these gardens. He encouraged her and, and uh, protected her. After she removed the veil publicly in 1848 and announced the advent of a new <coughs> age, thereby, you know, also Baha'u'llah's direct um, assistance of the principle of equality of men and women. And speaking about the strange coincidence of bicentenaries, uh, Tahir al-Qurratul Ain's birthday is also 1817, about 200 years ago. But don't worry, I'm not going in presentation today <laughs> to the life of Tahir. To the religious leaders of the world, so you saw there was just an extract to Queen Victoria, the rulers of the world. To the religious leaders of the world, which I thought for a center of the study of world religion, such a quote is necessary. What does Baha'u'llah uh, say? He says, the fundamental purpose animating the faith of God and his religion is to safeguard the interests and promote the unity of the human race and to foster the spirit of love and fellowship amongst men. Suffer it not to become a source of dissension and discord, of hate and enmity. Our hope is that the world's religious leaders and the rulers thereof will unitedly arise for the reformation of this age and the rehabilitation of its fortunes, let them, after meditating on its needs, take counsel together, and to anxious and full deliberation, administer to a diseased and sorely afflicted world the remedy it requires. So it is pretty clear when Baha'u'llah writes to the kings or to ecclesiastics, it is pretty clear to him that the challenge of accepting a new religion that unites all humanity this idea might, might not directly embraced by humanity, which is fine to Baha'u'llah. But he says, if you reject that idea, at least work, instead of the most great peace, for a lesser peace. For example, the political leaders can work for a political unification of the world. Whereas the religious leaders, Baha'u'llah says, if they stay in their own traditions, that's fine, but they should come together. It's kind of the idea of a parliament, which we started in 1893, and they should think about the exigencies and the needs of the time. Now I come to the last year of Baha'u'llah's life, and there's so much more to, to share with you about the life and writings of Baha'u'llah in light of the principle of unity, but I want to come to the last part about the, uh, the development of the American Baha'i community, which I'm very excited to present because I knew almost none of that uh, before I came in January to the United States, and I love actually the challenge to present something new. This is really new to me, what comes as, as next. In 1894, before going into the American Baha'i history, Baha'u'llah writes a written testament, the Kitab Ahd, which is important from a comparative perspective of religions. The founders of religions, the prophetic figures, the messengers in the past had wonderful and beautiful ideas. But after the passing of Muhammad, of Christ, of Buddha, usually the question of interpretation um, arises and creates schisms in the different religions. So Baha'u'llah wanted to protect the Baha'i community from disunity. And instead of having kind of an oral tradition, saying that thou art Peter as the follower of Jesus, he wanted to write something down that something is written in the hand of the Baha'i community. And in this testament, I just highlighted four different points for you. He exhorts to use religion and speech, the power of speech and words, for the purpose of achieving unity, and not to abuse it for the opposite. He enjoins obedience to all kinds of governments where the Baha'i communities live. He strengthens the foundation of Baha'i administration, that is the elected branch, which we call nowadays local and national assemblies and the House of Justice, and the appointed branch, which we, you know, we can call, as my translation, the council and uh, learned and among the people of Baha. In addition, he appoints Abdu'l-Baha, his eldest son, as a successor, 
an interpreter of the text in order to maintain unity of the community. Thereby, in 1892, Baha'u'llah, after 40 years of imprisonment, passes away around the age of 75. And the Baha'i community moves on into the era of Abdul Baha as the head of the Baha'i community, who will later on travel to the United States, as we will see in a few minutes. And from here on, I will go back to uh, the United States. And you remember that I started with 1893, Jessup, and him referring to the words of E.G. Brown. 1893 in the Parliament of the Religions is quite an interesting step, not only in light of dialogue between different religions, also its impact on the Baha'i faith. There was a young lady by the name Sarah Farmer who, who uh, lived close by in a place called Greenacre in Maine. And Sarah Farmer was inspired and had this idea to bring all kind of different leaders and spiritual thinkers um, into Greenacre together in kind of a, of a I, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but maybe a think tank for global spirituality. <laughs> The, the young uh, Vivekananda, who, who was praised um, by, by almost everyone after 93, actually sits here on the left next to Sarah Farmer. On her right is the ambassador of Armenia and then one of the transcendentalists at this time period. So we see many outstanding VIPs in the field of religion and theology um, uh, gathering around um, Sarah Farmer. Uh, as one professor recently wrote, uh, I think Professor Schmidt, Restless Souls uh, is the title of the book. He says, whereas the Parliament of Religions lasted 17 days, Greenacre lasted two decades. And it was a full success in light of bringing the diversity of different religions together. However, as things in life are not always that easy and they go with crisis and victory, um, in the life of Sarah Farmer, the more she met, and she says it, on the right side is an article, an interview I found, and she's speaking about her experience. And she said the more she met Zoroastrians and Jews and, and Christians, the more she found that there are similarities between the different religions. And so she was wondering, can there not be one formulated religion that will bring all of these different traditions together? And then she met the Baha'is in 1898. She became a friend of Phoebe, Phoebe Hurst. I'm sorry if I pronounce the names not always correctly. I, my mind is, I think it will till the last day of my life still work in, 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 in German. It's just very difficult to, for me sometimes to transgress. Uh, so she met Phoebe Hurst, and in 1898, they traveled to Haifa, kind of a pilgrimage. Both of them, Sarah Farmer and Phoebe Hurst, became Baha'is. And Phoebe Hurst was the wife of the US Senator, George Hurst and uh, who was a very r rich person, and therefore some immense funding went into Greenacre. Now, whereas she thought that she has now found uh, and, and arrived you know, at the objective of her life, <coughs> in the ba Baha'i faith, unifying all the religions, some of her colleagues in the, among theologians and transcendentalists were actually highly frustrated. They thought it is kind of a betrayal that someone who started as very open, you know, bringing all different religions and representatives of different faiths together, suddenly would submit herself to a movement with a charismatic figure like Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. And Professor Schmidt's book actually shows that tension in Greenacre um, very nicely. Again, because of the time, I cannot stay with it. And I apologize. I have to move on. So I mentioned Phoebe Hurst. Fascinating is that Sarah Farmer and Phoebe Hurst both were in touch with the famous Harvard professor in the field of psychology and the varieties of religion, William James. There's this huge William James building close by, and all of you are familiar with it. And I did some research, and I found, to my astonishment, that the early Baha'is in the Boston region and in Harvard, many of them were in touch with William James, although I was not yet able to find something in his writings directly. But I found a newspaper clip on the left side, you see Ali Kuli Khan, uh, charge de affair for the Iranian government in Washington. Married to Florence Breed, he also became a Baha'i and lived in the Boston area in Washington. And William James invited him 1905, 1906 to give, <coughs> give speeches on the Baha'i faith in his classes. So there's no doubt that William James 
um, favored or was in sympathy with the Baha'i faith. We don't know to what extent. But the, the article here at this point says, Harvard alumni aghast. <laughs> because <laughs> while William James was interested to foster this idea of the unity of religion as manifested in the Baha'i faith, quite a number of Harvard alumni were not in favor of that. I hope um, that's not going to repeat it in a few days when the <laughs> alumni meeting <laughs> takes place here, because I might have a presentation there as well. And after this, I have my doubts if I should do that presentation. <laughs> so um, just to mention to you, you know, this, the growth, as I said, the development of the Baha'i faith and the idea of unity and diversity. Because here, you can see, you know, this is an interracial marriage between an American and an Iranian. William um, uh, Ali Kuli Khan actually wrote another letter that just comes to mind to the president of Harvard by the name Elliot. He wrote to him, to Elliot, and said he wants to have an organization that connects Iran and America. And he spoke about this idea of racial unity. And Elliot very politely responded to him, and we have this letter, it is published, and he thanks him for this idea. He says he doesn't know too many professors who actually be, could, could be of help, really, to have this Iranian-American exchange. Um, and in light of the question of racial unity, well, certainly it is important that race, this is my own paraphrased words, okay, please do not take it literally. You can read the letter yourself later on. It was published by Marzia Gale, the daughter of Ali Kuli Khan. So he says, uh, Elliot continues, and he says that um, although certainly diff different races deserve respect, but the idea of mingling and mixing the races might be taking things a step too far. So you can s get an impression about this time period and the ideas how the Baha'is wanted to implement <laughs> racial uh, unity or the unity of religions. Um, two other outstanding figures in the early Baha'i history, both Harvard Divinity School graduates, Albert Veil and Stanwood Cobb from the Unitarian Church, actually got in touch with the Baha'i faith, met Abdul Baha when Abdul Baha traveled to the United States and to Greenacre around 1912 and 1913 and wrote about the Baha'i faith. And I thought I'd just quote for you from the Harvard Theological uh, Review, um, a quote from Albert Weil about which shows the principle of unity, how he understood it. I will not start with the first sentence, but uh, later on he says, um, what are the truths by the teaching of which the Baha'i movement is affecting the transformation of its followers' lives? They are very, there are very few. In fact, they can all be gathered under one supreme concept, the inherent unity of the universe. Written on almost every page of the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha are the words oneness, unity. Their supreme aim is to bring man to the tent of unity, this is a quote, the presence of singleness, another quote, the ocean of oneness. And oneness in its true significance means that God alone should be realized as the one power which animates and dominates all things which are but manifestations of its energy. All nature is one and reveals to the seeker the splendor of the ideal king. All the prophets speak one truth, declare one religion, manifest one God. The individual man is the potential manifestation of this one God. The immanence of God in the servants is taught with persistent intensity. Hence, men of all class, classes and races are the drops of one sea and the leaves of one tree. Many a mystic has beheld God in his own soul. The Baha'i teaching invites man to advance to the more universal view and behold his light in all humanity. Abdul Baha, this is the son of Baha'u'llah, was asked, why do guests that visit you come away with shining countenances? He answered, I cannot tell you, but in all those upon whom I look, I see only my father's face. By the inculcation of this few but simple sublime truth, would this new gospel not only regenerate the individual, but heal the disease of war and annul the blight of racial creedal and class antagonism and bring in the most great peace, which is actually taken directly from the World Parliament of the Religions. When you read the full article, you will see that Veil is referring to that. Now again, because of time, I will rush to the next two thinkers from Harvard. Um, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, I don't think he needs any introduction by, by, <laughs> by now to academics in, in this area, and his friend Elaine uh, uh, Locke. Um, both of them uh, visited Greenacre. 
Both of them, specifically, even more Du Bois, met Abdul Baha when Abdul Baha was visiting the United States. Du Bois actually took the photo of Abdul Baha and published it in the crisis as among the men of the month. Some a journal, to my understanding at that, that time, which, which was you know, um, highlighting af leading African Americans. So I think quite an unusual step to bring Abdul Baha. After publishing the, this photo, he took the full speech of Abdul Baha given and the NAAC, NAACP movement at that time, and he commented about it. Um, du Bois took also his friend Elaine Locke to meet Abdul Baha. Whereas Du Bois never became a Baha'i, was fascinated by the idea of unity, but he, he's, he, I think um, Cornel West writes in his book, The Prophetic Fire, in light of Max Weber's term, religious musicality. He was not religious, a, a part of a religious group, but he had his religious musicality, so he didn't become a member of any group. But his friend and philosopher, both graduated, I think, in philosophy from Harvard University, Locke became a Baha'i. And Locke later on wrote an article about the un principle of unity and diversity, wherein he clearly states um, that the principle of unity and diversity can be rooted and its origins are to be found in the writings and teachings of Baha'u'llah. But he says also, an intelligent Baha'i should not dwell where something comes from. He should rather think about how the question of unity and diversity can be implemented into society. More than where something comes from is the fact how can we together work to implement it into society? They had a third friend, Du Bois, by the name Louis Gregory. Louis Gregory became later on one of the outstanding Baha'is in the United States, a member of the National Assembly, um, the highest rank of the individual in the African Baha'i um, uh, community of the hands of the cause. And uh, he also married a white lady like Ali Kuli Khan. And so Louis and Louis Gregory were very active in race amity conferences. Um, I, I move a bit out from that and come to, to some other aspects related to Boston. Um, the famous Khalid Gibran, uh, who you see in, in front of the Boston Public Library, you, you, you see this memorial for Khalid Gibran. In his hand is the book, The Prophet. Gibran met Abdul Baha in 1912 and, and made a drawing of Abdul Baha. Um, which is in the New York, New York Museum. Uh, two professors by the name Jenkins and Sohail Bushrui, uh, who was a professor at Maryland on Gibran and the uh, Baha'i Chair for World Peace, uh, wrote about the encounter between Abdul Baha and Gibran. And when Abdul Baha met Gibran the first time, this is what Gibran says, Abdul Baha said that prophets and poets both three to the eye of God quite interesting in light of the principle of unity of poetry and, and prophecy, how it is brought together. Um, I'm not going to read that for you, but, but um, Bushui and Jenkins come to the conclusion that uh, the, the main identity, in a way, of Gibran, who lived in Boston and came from Lebanon uh, and Beirut, later on was in New York, his main identity was, was Christian. But at the same time, he was very interested. I think quite, he would be a fantastic, would have been a fantastic fellow at the Center for the Study of World Religions. Uh, he was very interested in universal ecumenism. And he would study the Upanishads, would be interested in Syrian Neoplatonism, the Judeo-Christian mysticism, Islamic Sufism, but also in the Baha'i teachings of universal love and the unity of religion as he learned it from Abdul Baha. Because you know, when Abdul Baha traveled to the United States, almost all of his talks and presentations were published in newspapers, and later on they were compiled in a book called <coughs> Promulgation of Universal Peace, for those of you who are interested. Um, Abdul Baha visited Chicago in 1912, in that year as well, and he led the, found the foundation for the cornerstone of the Baha'i Temple, the temple which you have seen in the flyer and the poster, which was. Uh, given as the in invitation for the um, meeting today. And, and when he led the foundation for the Baha'i Temple in Chicago, he actually very consciously asked representatives of different races to be present at that moment and to do this together with him. And he ga gave a speech, and in this speech, he speaks about the significance of temples in general, also the Baha'i Temple. He says the following. In brief, the original purpose of temples and houses of worship is simply that of unity, 
places of meeting where various peoples, different races, and souls of every capacity may come together in order that love and agreement should be manifested between them. That is why Baha'u'llah has commanded that the place of worship be built for all the religionists of the world, that all religions, races, and people may come together within its universal shelter, that the proclamation of the oneness of mankind shall go forth from its open courts of holiness, the announcement that humanity is the servant of God and that all are submerged in the ocean of his mercy, is the mashrul, it is the mashrul askar. The differences existing between nations and peoples will soon be annulled and the fundamentals of the divine religions which are no other than the oneness and solidarity of the human race are being established. For thousands of years, human race has been at war. It is enough. And I think, you know, that last sentence is beautiful in light of what we see everywhere in, in, in these last years all happening around us, whereas some people are really, from all different classes, creeds, and races, working for the unity of mankind. Others are very much interested to abuse the, the creeds and religions to create disunity. And it is not necessary to give you examples of the integration and disintegration which happens at the same time in this world. But this idea of unity of mankind, according to Abdul Baha, should also be an, an, um, expressed in the devotional life of a community. And this is the result of the foundation stone that Abdul Baha led in 1912. Uh, thank you for coming, bye bye. Um, the house of worship dedicated and uh, publicly, you know, being visited after 1953. I think it was a Canadian uh, architect by the name. Uh, Louis Bourgeois, who may, uh, led the design for this temple. This temple um, is a, has a circle as its foundation and has nine different doors because nine is the number of completion and uh, it is symbolic to invite all the different religions and cultures of the world to participate in the devotion. And uh, the different religions can also bring their sacred texts and it can be um, read or chanted to the audience, but there's no lit liturgical acts that are taking place in um, the house of worship. So uh, we have almost come to the end. Thank you for your patience. And I see some of you are a bit suffering. It's just a few more minutes and <laughs> we'll, we'll be out of that and we go in the question and answer session. The Baha'is, of course, did not only think about how to create devotional spaces and how unity and diversity should be expressed in a devotional life. So one of the aspects in the early history of the Baha'i community, and here's a picture by four representatives of the um, American Baha'i community at the United Nations in the 1948. On the left side, Professor Amin Banani, one of the outstanding scholars in Iranian studies at UCLA University in the United States. To his right side, Mildred Motahedeh, mother of Professor Roy Motahedeh. Um, to her right side, Hilda Yen, quite unknown even to many Baha'is. Hilda Yen is a very fascinating figure. She was a member of the Baha'i community, mainly, I think, because of her uncle. Her uncle, Dr. Cao, was, um, and here I apologize, but I also have to mention once Yale, I presented many things on Harvard, but her, her <laughs> uncle, Dr. Cao, was a, a medical graduate from Yale, became a Baha'i, moved to Beijing, and became the president of a university in Beijing. He translated Esselmont's Baha'u'llah and the New Era into Chinese, and therefore I think it is one of the first books that starts to present the Baha'is as an independent world religion, which came to her family. And then to the very right, Matthew Bullock, as far as I understand, an African-American Baha'i who also lived in the Boston region. So these were um, in 1948 at the United Nations, and specifically to Hilda Yen and Mildred Motahedeh, the United Nations accepted the Baha'is in different capacities, but also as an independent religion, which later on by Shoghi Effendi was congratulated for a, a huge step for the history of the Baha'i community worldwide and in the United States in light of the independence. And finally, as I promised, but speaking about diversity of expression, I thought I should go, go to music and end my presentation with something in music. That's a book by Fraser, To Be or Not To Bob about Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, Cornel West told me a few months ago that um, he did not about Du Bois and Abdu'l-Baha or about really that much about Locke and Abdu'l-Baha, 
but when he was uh, many decades ago, I think in Los Angeles, he met Dizzy Gillespie, and that's how he got familiar with the Baha'i faith. And Gillespie indeed was a member of the Baha'i community. And a few days ago, I made some search, and God, thanks to Google, if you, uh, <laughs> you type in some terms, you can find it, and you will see which term I was looking for in that book, uh, Baha'i, because I was trying to find something I had once heard many years ago. And this is the first time, actually, I'm introducing that into a presentation of mine. And I'm going to read it for you at the end of my presentation in a very, very astonishing way. All the things I have been thinking about, Baha'u'llah, unity of diversity, racial, um, the question of race problematic, the United Nations, and even more than architecture, maybe music, is presented in what um, Gillespie says. Uh, since here it is very small on my, uh, my computer, I will read it from there. He says, there's a parallel with jazz and religion. In jazz, a messenger comes to the music and spreads his influence to a certain point. And then another comes and takes you further. In religion, in the spiritual sense, God picks certain individuals from this world to lead mankind up to a certain point of spiritual development. Other leaders come, and they have the same Holy Spirit in their hands, so they are really one and the same. This means that Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism, all the major, all the major religions, are one and the same. The spiritual laws stay right and lay right there. They never change. The spiritual laws of Moses, Abraham, Buddha, Krishna, Zoroaster, Jesus, and Muhammad, all these people speak the same language. But the social order that goes with the changes with all the different, different prophets who come, they are the only ones who can do that. The garden of my faith, that is Shoghi Effendi, the successor of Baha'u'llah, the Baha'i faith, says that there has got to be an organic change in the structure of society. An organic change means that everything you see like it is now has got to be changed for the peace and contentment of the world. Everything you see. The way they're running the finances, the schools, the police department, the foreign affairs, everything has go got to go through an organic change to bring about this millennium of the oneness of mankind and the peace of the world, racial, political, any kind of prejudice is automatically out. That has got to be the establishment of it, there has got to be establishment of a universal auxiliary language. The Baha'i have an administrative setup and the United Nations, they consult with us to find out what Baha'u'llah said. He said it in the 19th century, but that's what will be coming and must come for a better world with peace and love and respect regardless of who you are and where you come from. When I encountered the Baha'i faith, it all went along with what I had always believed. I believed in the oneness of mankind. I believed we all come from the same source, that no race of people is inherently superior to any other. And they teach unity. I latched onto that. I believe that there is one God, and he manifests himself to mankind to great teachers for specific periods of time in our spiritual development, that he sends them periodically. It's like a real runner who has a baton in his hand. You could look at the world of God like a baton, the Holy Spirit. The runner grabs his baton and he runs and runs and runs. Why he runs, that is the revelation of what is happening. When he gets to the end, he passes it on to the next guy and he starts running with it. And that's the next religion. It's the same religion. It's just that a different prophet's running with it. He passes it to the next and the next and so until there is peace and unity of mankind on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you so much.